Turkey's president calls for a ceasefire in Gaza as he meets with Central Asian leaders at a regional summit in Astana. Is more international pressure building against Israel? Plus, how dire is the latest humanitarian situation in the besieged enclave? I'll cover that and more here on Straight Talk. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkar. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has visited Kazakhstan for the 10th summit of the Organization of Turkic States. Leaders across Central Asia and the South Caucasus are meeting as Israeli operations in Gaza intensify. President Erdogan, who has been extremely critical against the indiscriminate attacks against civilians by Israel, has used the platform to address the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. In his statement, he also called for Turkic states to come together against what he described as Israel's continuous crimes against humanity. As Turkey, we have adopted a principled and humanitarian stance from the moment this crisis first broke out. We have said and continue to say this at every opportunity. We do not approve of actions against civilians. Our priority is quickly establish a humanitarian ceasefire. We're also working on new mechanisms that will guarantee the security of everyone, regardless of whether they are Muslims, Christians or Jews. On the sidelines of the Asana summit, Erdogan also held bilateral meetings with leaders of the Turkic world to discuss everything from the fight against terrorism to regional stability and trade. The Organization of Turkic States was founded in 2009 to integrate Turkic-speaking countries and advance bilateral and regional trade ties. This year's summit comes as international pressure grows on Israel, which has come under fire over its disproportionate use of force in Gaza. And for more on the 10th summit of the Organization of Turkic States, joining me from Prague is Bruce Panier. He is a Central Asia analyst. Anna Jardanova, she is an associate fellow at the Association for International Affairs. And from Istanbul, Vehbi Baysan, he is an associate professor at Ibn Haldun University. A warm welcome to you all and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Bruce. Israel's ongoing bombardment of Gaza uh, took center stage at the OTC summit in Astana. How has the summit played out so far? Uh, well, you're right to say that this, this issue has taken center stage. Uh, they do have a lot to discuss besides what's happening in the Middle East. But um, this is clearly something that, that uh, all of them had an opinion on and, and, and a unified opinion, more or less. I mean, they condemned the collective punishment of the Palestinians. Um, so... In some ways, it echoes what they did last year with Ukraine, uh, but, but it was a little bit more harsh this time. Um, you know, but, but again, there are a lot of issues that this group has to cover right now because they're trying to become a global force, yeah. uh, a lot of influence internationally. So Palestine and Israel were one of the, one of the facets. It was the top, top item on the agenda, but there was many other things that they needed to cover also. Sure. So, Anna, is more international pressure building against Israel? I mean, is, as Bruce mentioned, is there a real collective approach by Turkic leaders against Israeli attacks on Palestinian civilians? Well, here I would make the difference between Turkey and the other member states, especially Central Asia member states, because from Central Asia we heard many calls for peace, many criticism of violence against civilians, especially Palestinian civilians, and also uh, declared humanitarian help, for example, for Palestinians. Just a day in the morning, if I remember well, Kazakhstan promised one million US dollars worth of humanitarian aid. Also, Uzbekistan called a meeting of diplomatic missions of uh, MENA countries around the region uh, calling for peace. They voted uh, in favor of the UN resolution on humanitarian truce. So in this regard, yes, the pressure is there. But if we are talking about on specific political uh, attacks on Israeli position, to put it this way, I think Turkey as a state would have much stronger words, much, much stronger expressions than the Central Asian members mm. of the nation. So, Vepi, what kind of a role could Turkey play in facilitating a humanitarian uh, ceasefire in Gaza? Yeah, uh, the first thing comes to mind is, of course, Turkey's uh, mediation. Uh, because it's just a strategic position, um, it gives them um, this opportunity because it has a pivotal role in between um, the Israelis and Gazans. Because 
as as we can see, the international community calling for a ceasefire, but there's very little they can do. And Turkey being in um, kind of a long-term relations with both partners can play that role. But it seems, of course, I mean, uh, the both sides need to uh, request for that and or at least support that initiative. Now, the Israeli side, it seems, especially the politicians, um, have not in a mood to listen anyone internationally for any even humanitarian act, whatever it is. And to begin with is the ceasefire, because that's atrocities taking place in the very eyes of the international community. But very little has been delivered to save these innocent people, innocent children and babies there. They're getting daily in hundreds killed. And mm -hmm. this is the massacre that in our modern times uh, we never witnessed. But it's happening in our very eyes, as I said, on TV screens daily you're seeing it. And we can't even imagine how Gazans are living under these circumstances. Yes. So um, Bruce Anna says Turkey has been more vocal uh, about its criticism and opposition against Israel's uh, brutality. Uh, some say Turkey's role in facilitating a, a humanitarian ceasefire could be limited. So the question is, what sort of leverage do these Central Asian countries have on pressuring regional players uh, for a truce? Well, you have to kind of break them apart individually. Uh, you know, Anna was quite right in saying that Turkey, of course, is is, is probably the most most hawkish uh, in their views of what's happening at the moment. But um, individual states have have different relationships with Israel. Now, we know Azerbaijan, for instance, which is a member of the organization of Turkic states, has been working with Israel on security matters for quite some time, uh, and it's really helped to develop uh, Azerbaijan's military and, and defense potential, um, which we've seen play out very well uh, recently and very effectively. Um, so, you know, Azerbaijan has, has an, uh, I suppose, a, a, a direct line to Israel. They might be able to help put some pressure on Israel to, to uh, cease fire or at least hold off on, on a full-scale military operation across the, into, into Gaza. Uzbekistan also has a, a long-standing relationship with Israel, too, sure. um, not only because of help that Israel has given them, but also because we have a, a lot of uh, Jewish people from the Buharan Jewish community who have emigrated to Israel in the past too. So they also have a connection with Israel uh, and they're not willing to totally break that, uh, you know, and uh, right now simply to condemn Israel for their actions in, in, uh, in Gaza. So, uh, you know, I mean, really you have to look at it individually from the states. They have set their own unique relationships with Israel, which could be effective in helping to, to, uh, to get Israel to call off its its troops, call off the intensity of the attacks that they're they're currently waging on on Gaza, um, you know. But at the same time, of course, they're they're strong partners with Turkey, so they're they're kind of have a balancing act at the moment as to approach this issue. So, but Anna, those countries, uh, although uh, Bruce evaluated them individually, but they have also strong trade ties. Uh, with one of the main supporters of Israel, like the United States and the European Union. So um, could they use their um, strong ties as a leverage? I think this bridge is a bit too far, because I, th I think in this case the bilateral negotiations are much much more important, especially since the violence is happening right now. Yeah, in in a long term, in a long term, yeah, Central Asian states can get more leverage or just more spaces to discuss and debate with European actors or the United States, etc. But since the violence is happening just right now, I, mm -hmm. I do have some doubt. So maybe by addressing uh, Gaza, the OTS seems to be signaling it wants to uh, have a more say uh, on the uh, global security issues. So how important has this organization become lately, especially in responding conflicts? And is it an effective one? Well, it has to be. At least the will is there, no doubt about it. And these countries trying to have more active role in the world politics, but specifically because it's a current issue, uh, specifically on the Middle East and on over the Gazans. So it is a, a quite positive um, step. But having said that, you can see that the world's superpowers are giving blank, blank check for Israelis or Israeli politicians that, uh, you know, they can kill these uh, people in Gaza. So that makes things quite difficult 
and they are shutting down all the doors for any type of negotiation or even for humanitarian ceasefire. So it's going to probably be remembered as a shame in our um, uh, history, but currently, at least these kind of organizations taking the initiative, they are demonstrating clearly that they want to do something about it on the humanitarian basis. And also, let's remember, they're kind of really putting behind their differences and different politics, etc., just to focus on these issues. But obviously, in order to have uh, effective policy and strategy developed for the region, they need some sort of open door, at least they can uh, deliver what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So, in, in, and to repeat my what I'm saying is that the will is there and that should be uh, you know, appreciated, but uh, uh, they have limited uh, uh, power uh, to, to, to actualize it. So, Bruce, uh, among uh, the other issues discussed at the summit is Turkmenistan's uh, full membership in the organization. Why do you think Ankara insists on Ashgabat's inclusion in this organization? There are several reasons. The first is connectivity. Turkmenistan has Caspian ports, of course. Uh, you know, it would be a, a good link uh, across the Caspian to Azerbaijan and then on to Turkey. Uh, or if you're headed east, across, of course, through Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan and into China. So it's, it's vital that Turkmenistan really step up a little bit and, and its full membership would help to smooth that out um, without a doubt. Uh, you know, the, there's other questions of the fact that uh, uh, energy, for instance, uh, you know, Tur Turkey and President Erdogan have been lobbying strongly for Turkmenistan to start exporting its gas to Europe. Um, you know, Turkey would be the hub. So obviously they stand to benefit from this. But but both Turkey and, and Azerbaijani President um, Aliyev have been really working on Turkmenistan to, one, to get full membership, two, to start start gas, natural gas exports to Europe, somehow uh, figure it out pipeline, but, but some way of getting this across so that they can supply um, Europe in substitute for the Russian gas that the Europeans are no longer buying. So they really want Turkmenistan to be a, a partner. Unfortunately for them, Turkmenistan is kind of a fickle government. Uh, and in fact, we're not really sure who's even running the country. Is it the president or is it his father, who's the chairman of the People's Council? Uh, they both seem to have equal weight in the country and they, they alternate in attending meetings. So it's it's uh, they've made it difficult to figure out who you're dealing with. And uh, whose opinion you should give more weight to, because they do differ a little mm -hmm. bit on these topics. But uh, for Turkey, it's vital that, you know, Turkmenistan, one, become a full member, and two, just to play, you know, play along with what they're trying to accomplish, uh, you know, which is connect a connectivity role and an energy supplying role. So uh, moving from Central Asia to Iran, uh, meanwhile, Iranian foreign minister was in Ankara on Wednesday where he met his uh, Turkish counterpart, Hakan Fidan. He made the following statement. Uh, during a joint uh, press conference. Let's have a listen, then we'll continue to talk. If this war is not stopped immediately and the joint attacks against civilians, the women and children of Gaza by America and Israel are not halted, then the consequences for those who are waging this war will be great. So, Anna, uh, what kind of consequences were the uh, Iranian foreign minister was uh, talking about? I mean, is there a real risk of Iranian intervention into this conflict? Um, I hope it isn't. I hope it isn't. And I believe if there is a talk about this topic in, uh, in a Kazakhstan at this summit right now, they are discussing the ways how to prevent such an ex escalation, because at least considering the member, uh, Central Asian members of the organization, this would be against of interest of basically anyone. Their primary interest is to have a stable neighborhood, building alternatives, being safe food, safe connectivity, etc. Et unfortunately, what's happening in Tehran at this point is something I, I cannot predict. I'm not even sure who can predict uh, something mm. like this. I hope it will just uh, stay in line of words. Mm. So, Vipi and Iran's uh, President Raisi is set to visit Turkey very soon. What message is that intended to send? And can Iran help Turkey's efforts to become a guarantor country in solving uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict? Well, since the beginning, I mean, the, the very first day of what uh, Hamas operation, the early hours, um, somehow, with no proof and explanation, in Israel, fingers started pointing Iran. But geographically, if you look at the map, there is no way Iran would have access, unless, of course, 
uh, uh, Israel opened the corridor and, uh, and, and helped delivering all these uh, weaponry to Hamas. So otherwise, it's next to impossible. But however, they started always mentioning Iran, blaming Iran for all this, what had happened. Sometimes they dropped it out, but it, they always left it on the table. So that's a serious threat for Iran because we know in the last couple of years, uh, Israeli fighter jets bombed Iran several times in their uh, military capacity or even in some areas civilians got killed. So we also know that uh, Israel keep bombing Syria, uh, blaming that these are uh, Iranian camps and all the rest of it. So Raisi's visit is very important to get this support of uh, Turkey, and I'm sure Turkey would like to be mediating for this issue as well, because until today, we don't have uh, really concrete evidence that Iran has any involvement with Hamas and the Hamas' operations uh, on the 7th of October. Mm -hmm. So that brings us into what's happening in southern Lebanon. Of course, Hezbollah is always blamed as uh, a proxy for Iran and uh, through which Iran is attacking Israel. So if these arguments find grounds, it seems that uh, both America and Israel preparing an attack against Iran, that is to say that it's going to widen the scope of Israeli attacks in the Middle East mm -hmm. mercilessly, and also many civilians will be in, in the target too. Yes. So, Bruce, how do you see the situation? U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel uh, on Friday. What should be expected of his visit? I mean, is he likely to put more pressure uh, to bring about a humanitarian pause, just as proposed by U.S. President Joe Biden? Uh, one would hope so. Um, you know, I imagine that is going to be at least part of his discussion with Israeli officials, is the fact that this is playing out very poorly on the world stage. Uh, there's almost universal condemnation of, of the current tactics that Israel is employing in Gaza. Uh, you know, I mentioned collective punishment at the start. I mean, UN officials have called them out for that and saying this is actually amounts to a war crime. Um, you know, the U.S. obviously is a longtime supporter and strong supporter of Israel, but uh, the, I think his message has got to be that, you know, um, this is this is a little this is over the over the top. This is too much. Uh, you know, while everyone can respect a country's right to defend its borders and defend its citizens, uh, you can't practice a widespread destruction and, and you know mass killing of of innocent civilians um, simply to justify. Uh, uh, you know, your own safety uh, that that seems to be a little bit too far. So hopefully. He will say um, you're going to have to scale back and actually even a ceasefire would be desirable at this moment uh, and let diplomacy have a chance at this and end your military operation, or at least pause it. Mm. So, Anna, what do you think? Would Israel listen to him? And what do you make of the international community's response or rather inaction towards the Israeli actions, especially when it comes to Western countries? I mean, what do you think is holding them back? Um, I, I think it, we really have to differentiate state by state or, or box state by state. Uh, the Western countries, at least some of them, do support Israel uh, because of their domestic, purely purely domestic positions. For example, Czech Republic, uh, uh, which I am from, where I am from, they really do support Israel historically, and there's not even much space for criticizing Israel. With bearing in mind, in, as Bruce mentioned, the right to defense, right to defend the borders and the state, there's very little space to actually discussing what's happening in Gaza right now. On the contrary, there are actors that are. Uh, supporting the Palestinian or uh, Palestinian case, not necessarily Hamas, but Palestinian case, including, for example, members, uh, members of Central, Central Asian members of uh, the organizations. And here I, I actually see a very good opportunity, especially for countries like Kazakhstan, to develop uh, to some extent, normative approach to peace in the Middle East and the broader MENA region, because they, they are big players, they are becoming very relevant players uh, in, in the continent, and they do have the credit to actually uh, create 
space for negotiation, not only regarding Israel and Palestine, but for example, also, also Afghanistan, and this type of conflict. So in the long run, I really do have very, very significant hope for countries like Kazakhstan and Central Asia, to some extent Turkey as well, in, the, in this case. So, Vivi, there have been continuous protests in Western capitals and, uh, against Israel's attacks uh, on Palestine. So do you see a changing tide in the world, especially when it comes to Israel's uh, attacks uh, on Gaza, that they have gone so far? Well, the, on the public sphere, of course, there's a lot of reaction. There's a growing anger because uh, innocent babies, children are all killed indiscriminately and in a really brutal way and often broadcasted live. So that, I mean, in any, any sense, it hurts anybody has some uh, feelings. And, uh, of course, they're also furious uh, that humanitarian aid is not allowed in the... Um, in, in Gaza, as well as the like a wall uh, crimes that can be considered, they're hitting the, um, the the hospitals as well. So a lot of people got killed there. But it seems the governments have this bizarre approach to the incident that actually Israel has absolute right to defend its borders. But what borders we're talking about? Hamas. Uh, military operations took place in the occupied land. This is to say that this is the land stolen from these people, and in the last 75 years, they were subjected to the bullying and abuse. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not supporting what had happened there, um, because I have many Israeli friends as well. But also, Israeli politicians gave this false sense of security to those people who can go as, as close as uh, Gaza and establish their uh, those so-called settlements on the stolen land again and continue their lives while uh, Gaza turned into a world's open-air uh, prison. Um, yes. I mean, now, just remember that they cut the water, but the water wasn't there 24-7. Water was there two hours a day. They're, again, whatever, if they can dig on the ground, they could possibly get a bit of water uh, to drink, and that water would be also mixed with the seawater. Yes. So we're talking about the 75 years of abuse, and that should be seen, but unfortunately, the government's just turning their uh, deaf ear and uh, blind eyes. So, Bruce, UN says Palestinian people are at great, grave risk of uh, genocide. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, will or should there be any uh, legal action against Israel once this conflict had ceased? I'm not sure what kind of international legal re, uh, reaction or, or they could they could enforce. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, we, we've seen this situation playing out for decades now, and there, so it, it's very difficult to say what what the solution is to this is genocide. I, I'm hesitant to say it's genocide because that doesn't seem to be the intent of this. So the intent of this seems to be to to degrade and deteriorate the situation in Gaza to the point where it can no longer be used as an effective uh, base or launching pad for attacks on Israel. I think what they want is is to make sure that there is no possibility for Hamas to use this area again to attack Israel. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think that their intent is, is genocide of, of the Palestinian people. What they would like is certainly is, is to, to drive them back and uh, away from the what they call their, they claim is their border right now, um, and make sure that it is impossible to launch a similar attack in the future. And in their eyes, in their view right now, that seems to be, um, <coughs> excuse me again, um, you know, disrupting the infrastructure so it's impossible to, to assemble an attack like that again. Mm -hmm. So, Anna, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has also outlined U.S. policy in post-war Gaza. <coughs> He basically suggested a revitalized Palestinian authority should govern Gaza if Israel uh, decisively uh, defeats Hamas. How realistic and applicable is this? Uh, well, I think it really depends on the credibility that the United States will be able to get as a, as a player, given their close relationship with Israel. It really depends how the people in Palestine will accept the U.S. presence and, you know, in, this, in this conflict, which, frankly speaking, I, I have a difficulty to imagine at this point, but it's, it's possible that I am too pessimistic and they will be able to bring people to one table and to, to honestly and constructively discuss something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see much space for this at this moment. 
uh, but I don't exclude the possibility entirely. So, Vepi, what do you think? Uh, how could this decades-old conflict be resolved through a revitalized a current Palestinian authority? I mean, are new actors likely to emerge? Well, if you if you continue the same policies as we have seen in the last uh, 75 years, but certainly, uh, I mean, we should look into the circumstances and the reasons what created Hamas and what made them win the elections in uh, Gaza. So these are the unfair treatment those those people subjected to, unfortunately, in, 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 in that uh, international uh, uh, community did not help much. Mm -hmm. So if now Hamas is the target, if they're annoyed about the, the, the world of it, I mean, uh, something else is going to come up. Uh, if you don't change the circumstance, if you treat these people as people with their own dignity in their own land where it is recognized as a Palestinian land and recognized as the occupied territories. Yes. This is to say that, I mean, this two-state solution should be really on the table and implemented as soon as possible. There is no other way. And these people should have the right to live in their own territory, in their own land, with their own dignity. I mm. think that's the only solution. All right, Vepi, Anna and Bruce, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk. And thank you for watching this edition of Straight Talk. Be sure to share your thoughts with us on X at Straight Talk TRT. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel. From me, Aisha Subarkash and the team, take care and goodbye.